three months into my first job out of college, I was working on a broken build one night in the office all by myself at 2 a.m. and not getting anywhere and seriously questioning the career choice I had made. Uh, and I was tired, I was making mistakes, and so I ended up, I, I just went home. I went home, got an insufficient amount of sleep, came back in the next day to try and track down dependencies. It was a, it was a very bad day at, at our uh, job at Boeing. We, Boeing had missed its commitment with the United States Air Force on that project. And uh, you know, fast forward 10 years later, three different jobs later, um, but we're still, you know, some things are better, but, but some things are still the same, right? At least now, configuration management was cool, and people willingly checked their code and resource control without me having to bug them to do so. And I remember that Connect Software came out with a tool uh, that allowed it. It was, it was a beautiful thing. We were able to automate our builds and, and deployments. But yet, there we were at 2 a.m. in the morning on release night, dealing with SQL replication issues and wondering what version of that DLL we were supposed to use. Uh, and, you know, 10 years of sleep deprivation takes its toll. And so my heart goes out to a lot of people in that situation. There's got to be a better way to do it. In 2006, our team started using Kanban, and it was the first time in my IT career that we finally found a way to deal with everything that was on my plate and still get a decent night's sleep. And so, um, you know, for those of you, I know there's some out there who don't need any sleep, uh, just, um, just swap that out for something that you would like to get more of. The point is, it's really, it's, it's just frustrating and it's very hard for people who are overburdened to have the time to take pride in their work. And that, that's a problem, right? People should be able to have, take pride in their work and not be so frustrated all the time. Uh, I think the cycle of frustration is pervasive. Uh, it, it's, it's, I see it everywhere, right? Customers want their, you know, they don't know why it's taking so long for them to get their simple little feature they requested a few months ago. Uh, ops teams feel like there's just too much workload. Um, uh, upstream teams wonder where their requests went, right? There's not enough transparency. Um, and there's just this radical and constant shift in prioritizations. Or sometimes there's a battle between all the priorities and everything is a priority one, right? Who, who here is dealing with this? Right? We've got a couple brave souls raising their hands here, Maybe about 5 to 10% of the audience. When everything is a priority one, context switching raises its ugly head, right? And context switching can be very expensive. And irritating, it's irritating to get interrupted when you're in deep thought trying to solve a, a problem, trying to find a solution. Excuse me, um, we need access to this database on this server. You know, it takes time to get back into uh, what you were doing. It, t it takes longer for things to get delivered when you have context switching. So now we've got overburdened people who are irritated. It's, it's, not, it's not a good situation. Um, so what to do about it? I find that if we, can, if we can find a way to demonstrate to the people up the food chain making the decisions on prioritization, we at least have a shot at negotiating how that prioritization process so work. Sometimes just bring in visibility to the work is enough to help people understand. And making work visible, it's the first of six Kanban practices I'm going to run through today. Uh, make work visible. If you make work visible, at least people can see what's going on. Right? This is knowledge work made visible. And we do this for a number of reasons listed here. You know, it's hard to manage invisible work. Uh, when you make work visual, uh, you know, we can, we can take in information much faster through our eyes than any other sense. And you can quickly glance at this visual and you can see, okay, well, there's three projects going on and we've got some red, you know, emergencies floating through the, the top lane there, the top expedite swim lane. 
those are live issues that maybe the NUC is dealing with, or there you know, maybe some kind of security breach where we had all hands on deck. We're bringing visibility to the different types of work that we're dealing with. I've got this um, project lane where all the projects are flowing through, and then we've got a miscellaneous swim lane where we've got some gray tickets and purple tickets. And the gray tickets are, they're like maintenance. They're like CLDB, cost of doing business. Uh, we just have a lot of that. Purple tickets, use your imagination. I like to think of those as R&D, research and development, or whatever it is you want to track. For those of you that are colorblind in the room, uh, and it's about 10% of the male population in the US, so there's probably at least five or six of you out there that are colorblind. Uh, we do have ways to address that by using different shapes or different patterns or just decide not to use red and green since those are the colors that tend to be most confused. Um, the, the point here is that, uh, or somebody made the point earlier today, Jeff Patton, about data does not equal empathy. But when you can visualize data in a, in a certain way, then it can help bring about an understanding. You can see where things start piling up, right? This validate uh, queue toward the end before close, there things are piling up, and so that can signal a, a problem to us. This is just a sample board, right? Um, Kanban is, you know, we're not prescriptively saying this is how your design should be. This is just a board that worked quite well at a particular customer site. And I always get the question about, well, physical board or electronic board, what are some of the electronic tools we can use? And I find it's great if you can use both. If you can have both a physical board that you can, you know, feel and touch and move about and be creative with no constraints, it's great. But if your team has a high volume of ticket flow, it, might, it doesn't make sense to put every single little ticket up on your board. Um, but maybe you could do a temporary board and put up those things that are irritating the team, uh, like all this work that's uh, piling up at the end. You know, where we have pileups, we have bottlenecks. When upstream's team, when upstream teams increase their throughput, and the downstream teams aren't able to consume it, it, it you know what happens? What good does it do? if development is delivering features faster and faster when the teams downstream can't consume it at that pace. Right? We can only move as fast as the slowest moving piece. And that's why we have work in progress limits with Kanban, which is a second practice that we use. We're putting uh, numbers here to say, here's where our limit should be. The, the standard way, based on the theory of constraints, would be to limit the flow to the tempo of the slowest moving bit, the, the constraint that's in the system, because that's the fastest that we can possibly go, right? And so where to begin? Where do we start? What, what is that magic number? Um, I, I find the best way to start is just start where you are. How much work do you have flowing through your system right now? Put that number up there, make it visible, and then experiment. Is that right? Is that too much? Are people overburdened? Probably. Then maybe we need to bring those numbers down. Um, so one way that you can have a bit of a bargaining chip uh, with the teams that you're working with is to just demonstrate how much work you actually have in progress there. Um, you know, Because knowledge work is perishable. The longer it takes, from the time you have to set something aside because you got interrupted, the longer it takes then to pick that back up and work on it, you might have, have forgotten. Uh, it'll just take time to, to dig back into that. Now, here, here's the deal about work in progress limits. They set, they bring in tension, right? Work in progress limits introduce tension into the organization that you have to deal with. It's not comfortable. It's like the stress that Adrian was talking about this morning. You add stress into your system so that you can see where it breaks. The whip limits introduce tension 
and they help provoke the kind of conversations that need to be had. And they may be uncomfortable, but if it was easy, anybody could do it, right? Uh, you know, we don't let our computers get to 100% capacity utilization. Why do we let our people? This is not sustainable, right? When you're working day in and day out and at two in the morning, uh, it doesn't take very long before you get burnout and, and people leave. So we're trying to find a sustainable way, a sustainable flow that we can keep up with the pace. We've got two choices. We can either you know, push back on the demand or we can increase the capability of the team which is probably going to take some time, right? We need to build up that skill set knowledge. Maybe we need to hire some more people. You know, what tools are they using? What's the capacity of the team to do the work? There's a lot of uh, attributes that make up the team's capability. And as soon as one of them leaves or gets hired on, then your capability probably goes down. So what to do? How do we get a sustainable approach? Uh, what are some rules? that we're using that are hindering us or helping us. And that's the third Kanban practice, is to make process policies explicit. Or this is saying, what are the rules of the game? What are the rules at your organization that's either driving fast flow or preventing it? Uh, and some rules, if they're tacit or tribal, you know, they're not well understood, at least to new people. So let's look at some of these, some of these rules. Um, so if you've got, if you're trying to go in a certain direction and you have to stop in order to get there, it's going to decrease your flow. If the only way to get somewhere, if the only way to turn left is to stop and wait for a green light, then you're going to have this stop and go. Things will take longer and people get irritated. So we need to look at what are some other options besides this stop and go. I think the roundabout is a nice example of that because they've, they found a way to keep things flowing, right? They've minimized stop and go. You don't have to wait. There's no lights. It's cheaper. Uh, throughput's increased by 20% because they measured it. And measurement is um, the fourth practice. But first, just an example of some rules here on this Kanban board. Uh, first of all, in the done column here. We'll just walk through this real quick. There's a backlog. Um, then they put work on DAC. The backlog, by the way, this work isn't prioritized. It's not stack ranked, right? It's just a list of uncommitted, unprioritized items that somebody wants to get done. Right? It's not committed to, it's not prioritized until it's pulled into the on deck queue. Kanban, by the way, is a, mostly a pull system. We're pulling work into our queue based on our capacity or the team's capacity to handle the work. If there's no capacity, then the work doesn't get pulled in. It's like, only take, you know, only take on what you can chew, right? Finish, let's, let's focus on the end here. Focus on finishing work before pulling in new work. Uh, and then they've got some rules here. Back up. They've got some rules down here. What's the definition of done on, on some of these? Their definition of done, right down here. Uh, they need, you know, some work, the criteria is they got to get cab approval first, or maybe it needs an architectural review, or InfoSec needs to buy off on it. I mean, the first rule is stop hiding the rules. Get them out there where people can see them, make them aware of what the rules are. It's much easier to have a conversation about changing a rule or improving it if it's explicit. If people are unsure it's not explicit, then it's harder to improve it. Uh, but what about prioritization? That seems to, last year I was, I was speaking about the problems that ops teams face as far as you know, dependencies and distributed teams and interrupt-driven work. But I'm finding now that probably one of the biggest issues is prioritization, conflicting priorities, causing a lot of heartburn. So what's the priori what is the prioritization process? Right? Is that explicit? How do things get escalated? What is that process? Is it just by whoever yells the loudest, or is it based off of political weight? 
right? Where your boss, somebody's boss tells your director and then it comes over it down and then things get escalated. Um, so come up with a, a policy for prioritization and escalation. Uh, I want to just point out this box in the corner here. These were, you know, we have these red expedites that are going through the top lane and projects going through the middle lane. And these items in the box here, it's a spot to put items that need further analysis, they need further retrospection. They got delivered and they're done, but there were problems with them and we want to address them later. So we put them on a spot on the board there for us to peek at later. What if one of the rules was that work got prioritized by cost of delay, right? In, in finding a way to bring some non-emotional, logical, quantitative reasoning to how we should prioritize. And a guy who's been doing a lot of work on this is Troy McGinnis from Focused Objective. He uses Monte Carlo simulation to determine uh, different timings and, and forecasting. And I think this is a great start for ops. Right? What didn't go out or get done that could have or should have? Right? We can calculate the cost of delay per project per day. But then in the ops world, we also need to take account of keeping production stable and secure. Right? We have more variability there. There's a higher risk. So that needs to be factored into this equation. What is the probability of getting a DDoS attack? or some security breach, and how much would that cost the, the company? Uh, if you're tracking those kind of issues in your system, if you're tracking expedites, then you can measure them. Fourth Kanban practice. We're, measure, we're very interested in measuring the flow of work that goes from beginning to end, uh, and the individual amounts of cycle time. So always a always a great conversation. What is lead time? What, what is cycle time? I'm just going to simplify it by saying lead time is when the customer requested something to when they got it. And cycle time is how long it takes once you've committed to do that work. But you can calculate the cycle time for each queue on your Kanban board. And then that's going to provide you some historical data to use for forecasting, and you won't have to rely so much on guessing or estimating how long things are taking. Aging reports are fabulous. Uh, if you're measuring cycle time, you'll have, you, know, you can get an average and a median and a mean, um, but the aging report is, is just, it's, it's a huge eye opener, right? If you've got things, this is real data. Right, things sitting in um, implementation queues for over 180 days. If, if you can pull up how long we're, it's like rotten fruit, right? The longer it sits, the you know the costlier it is, the the more frustrated people get, right? So think about aging reports, bringing attention to some of these dependencies, and then. The rate of the flow, this is a good one. And you've already got it if you're using JIRA. You can see the rate of incoming work versus the rate of outgoing work. And if you're incoming work, which would be in the red or brown, if that slope is exploding out uh, instead of closing up with the green, green is the work that's closing, you'll be able to see really quickly in a one-shot glance if your team has a lot much more demand than they're able to deal with. Uh, bottom line is looking at being objective at the data. Right? Love couldn't resist this slide. You know, our, how much time do we really spend waiting on third-party vendors? Let's be realistic here. Um, next up is feedback loops and offering up opportunities to be heard frequently and often, kind of like merge early and often. Uh, one thing we've had a lot of success with lately is Lean Coffee. Anybody go to Lean Coffee's? Got a couple of Lean Coffee's here. Lean Coffee, real quickly, is an opportunity to, to have a bit of a 
more intimate session with five or six people. You go grab coffee, you get out of the office, and you sit down, and everybody writes a couple things on a post-it note that they have energy to talk about. And then people, you get three votes. People can vote all three on one or vote three across different items. And then you run them through a Kanban, just real simple, to do, doing, and done. And you time box the items in to do, in doing. So after five minutes, the beeper goes off, and you thumbs up or thumbs down, and you, the team decides if you want to continue the conversation on. But we can take these, and we can start to see patterns week after week after week. And you can, uh, it gives the team an opportunity to feel like they've been heard. You can rotate people in and out to keep it a small group. Fantastic way to get feedback that you wouldn't get otherwise unless you, know, you go out for beers after work. It's impossible sometimes to discover these kinds of issues at larger meetings, like uh, ops review. But we still need to do ops review. Um, ops review is a monthly, where, where Link Coffee would be weekly, ops review is monthly. And this is where we're gathering everybody in the organization, and we're looking at the data. And the team leads are presenting the, basically, they're presenting the balance that their team is dealing with, the demand that's coming on their team, and then their ability, their capability to meet that demand. Right, that's what we're interested. Uh, and everybody hears the same message at the same time. Right? This is actually a picture of um, the first Solvay conference in 1911 in Brussels, and I kind of liked it because the subject was radiation and the quanta, and Einstein is the youngest physicist. He's second from the right. When we're looking at what kind of data to measure and track and present at Ops Review, here you go, these, these five things across trend and across the variability uh, will be quite useful. And the, the top three, work in progress, cycle time, or lead time, and throughput, you can get all of those out of a cumulative flow diagram, which is one of the uh, most used Kanban uh, charts, and many of the electronic tools will automatically generate those for you. But if not, you can do it using Excel. So there we have six Kanban practices all on one sheet. Uh, quick review. So most importantly, make work visible because it's hard to manage invisible work. And oftentimes, you know, if it is out there on a wall in front of people, at least they'll see it, especially, especially if it's on the way to the coffee or on the way to the VP's desk. The last place I was at, the VP doesn't have a lot of time to go look at stats in JIRA, right? But if you put it on the way to his desk, it, it's like covert or, or um, covert Kanban, right? Or stealth Kanban. If you can get the if you can design your Kanban system in such a way that it's revealing what is irritating to the people doing the work and irritating to the customers that the work gets delivered to, now you've got a way to start having that conversation that needs to, that needs to be had and to find some of that empathy that Jeff was talking about this morning. Number six is... Uh, collaborate uh, and experiment with, a, with models and theory. And so here's a list of reading material that the people in the Kanban community often talk about. The first is the goal. Uh, this is a story about the theory of constraints, which is the study of bottlenecks, famous book that Gene Kim's Phoenix Project, I guess you all got a copy of that. Uh, anybody who's been working in ops for some time can relate to that. Lean Startup, uh, just, you know, Eric talks about having this, um, uh, this meeting where you pivot, right? You decide if you're going to pivot or not, and I liken that to the ops review meeting where you're looking at the data to see if you need to go in that direction or change. And then Deming. Deming's the guy who went to Japan in the 50s and taught all these Japanese businessmen uh, about um, why... Uh, why, organization, why organizing teams in functional silos does not work because we don't deliver work that way. We deliver work across different 
functions. Uh, fab fabulous, fabulous read there. And then down on the bottom right, David Anderson's book on Kanban, sort of the leading how-to do book on Kanban. Uh, and then the commitment books, a new book out. Uh, it's about real options theory and looking at options in more of a business language use, if we can learn to speak in the language of the business and have them understand that options expire, quite useful. It's a graphic um, business novel. And then David Reinertsen's Flow book. So if you want to get into the deep math on queuing theory to understand why using queues is helpful, you know, Kanban's based on queues, right? Not so much on timeline. We manage work through queues. It's a leading Queues are a leading indicator, because we know the more work that's in the queue, the longer things are going to take. Right. Great read there. And then uh, Troy, <clears throat> Troy McGinnis's book on using Monte Carlo simulation to do forecasting and cost of delay. Uh, so just ending up with Grumpy Cat here. I mean, sometimes, I said earlier that Kanban gave me a way to deal with everything on my plate and still get a decent night's sleep. Dealing with everything on my plate doesn't mean having to say yes to everything. I mean, we can only do so much, and sometimes we have to push back and say, no, the team does not have capacity to deal with that right now. And, and, and that's okay. People don't expect you to do everything, right? I mean, you can't, you can't do a million things at the same time. Um, just final slide here, and a picture of the uh, Kanban for ops game that uh, we've been playing. OK. I think we're out of time. OK. OK. So we have time for a couple of questions. If you want to come forward, just line up behind the mic, and we'll just take them serially. I have a question. Uh -huh. So um, one question that I had is you, you talk about queuing for kind of the system of work. Uh -huh. And um, a lot of the work that I have the systems do is also very queued. So is there some kind of like grand unified theory of Kanban where I can get those to work together and kind of a feedback loop? Are you talking about? Having, are you talking about prioritization? Well, everything, just having, you know, kind of a conceptual framework that, that touches, you know, both on the, the flow that we do mm -hmm. plus, you know, the flow that flows through the systems that's all queued and, you know, limited to work in progress. It's, I, I see them as the same things. It, I mean, it sounds like it. Is it a question of tools? Yeah, so, just, yeah, it's not, it's tools and, you know, concepts and, you know, trying to apply the same thing. You know? Yeah, so one cool tool is, uh, it's called, um, they didn't pay me to say this or anything, but it's Gymflow, and so it's an electronic tool, but yet you have a board too. So mm -hmm. it prints out the tickets, it's yep. got a QR code on it, are you familiar with this? No. You can put it up on your board, you put a time-lapse camera in front of it, and as people are pushing tickets across the board, it takes pictures and it automatically updates the, the tool. So it's the best of That's both cool. worlds. So you can watch the video of it at uh, you know, gymflow.com. Is it G-Y-M or J-I-M? Uh, J-I-M-F-L-O-W. Okay. I, I, think the, I think the message, the lesson is what's the, what's the most irritating thing you guys are dealing with? Mm -hmm. How do we bring some visibility to that so we can improve it? Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We got one more. Okay. Or two quick ones. Two two quick ones. Um, in your in your slide about oops, there we go. <laughs> in your slide about uh, quantitative measures, you had quality listed as one of yeah. those items, and I was wondering if we, you had yeah. time to expand on that. How can Kanban help that's, us measure quality? Yeah, that's a really hard one. So a couple of things is rework. Uh, How many times the ticket comes back into well, the queue? Or? or if they're getting closed and then they're getting reopened, like why is that? Did we not understand something? Did, you know, did we miscommunicate? Um, so rework is, is hard. And then also I think looking at the number of expedites is, is mm. a telltale sign, right? If 63% if of the work we're doing is expedites, does that sound right? 
I mean, it could be that's, that's how your team works. You know, if you're at help desk or your call center, that's the nature of the demand of your work and that's to be expected. But if that's not your situation and that seems really high, then measuring the number of expedites. Because like that could be an indication that previous work that was done wasn't done at yeah. the level of quality. Yeah, that it I mean, it doesn't tell you why. It may not tell you why, right? You're going to have to dig into sure, the but why. It, I can see why that could know. be. Is, does our architecture flag. not allow us to, to work in this fashion? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, so I was curious, um, you know, I work in an ops team, and uh, like a lot of ops teams, we've, you know, we've been looking at a variety of different ways to try to implement, you know, uh, limits of work in progress or like pull, pull models yeah. or whatnot. Uh, but our organization insists on us doing like long-term forecasting and, and committing to piles of work like, you know, one to two quarters ahead of time. Which, and we know that doesn't really work, right? Yeah. So do you have any advice on how to, like, how to, how to mitigate that, like, inside of an organization? Yeah. Are you tracking that now? Are you tracking the work that's not happening two quarters later? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're tracking it a lot better now. So it sounds like you probably have the data there to make a case on something that's not working that you can demonstrate maybe at an ops review to, I mean, you just demonstrate, here's what happened, we did, you know, we missed our commitment, here's why. Uh, it, it could be, though, that, I mean, cost of delay isn't always financial, sometimes it's right. political. And if that's the, the problem, then you've got to, I, I found that just trying to, uh, I found the best way to get empath empathy is to show the data in a non-emotional way because ranting, I, I couldn't get ranting to work. Right, but I mean, we, we're still kind of le left with this situation where we're being forced to commit to a pile of work that then we can't complete and then we're forced to play kick the can and, and it just seems that we're constantly trying to catch up to that instead of getting Yeah, of and so, I mean, Deming's book, oh, there's something that's driving that behavior. What, what is that? And that's, I think, what you need to bring visibility to. Tell yeah. me how you're going to measure me, and I'll tell you how I'm going to behave. And if there's, um, you know, if people are being measured or their merit reviews or they've just come on board and they only have 90 days or, I, I don't know what your situation was. I'd love to talk to you afterwards to, sure. to hear more. But um, mm -hmm. I, I, hear, I hear that a lot, and I, I think that if you can show and demonstrate well, actual data that has not worked. For, yeah, yeah, for us, it's becoming a barrier to getting the people to adopt these tools because they can't wrap their heads around the idea that we would not commit to getting anything yeah. done. You know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> rather than just focusing on bring them to Bring them to the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We have a 15-minute break, and we have our next talk at noon. Thank you.